The Tom Woods Show, episode 654. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy this show, you're really going to like the free course I've made available to you on the real history of the U.S. presidents. Very, very helpful, especially during an election year. Check it out at freehistorycourse.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We've got a grown-up topic today, even though it's going to revolve around a children's book. And in particular today, we're talking about different ways government can hobble competition and can benefit established interests. So we've seen that, for example, obviously, in the way municipalities have dealt with Uber or the way food trucks are treated and on and on down the line. There are a lot of examples. And today, I'm welcoming back to the show Connor Boyack. Now, you may recognize Connor's name from previous episodes in which he's come on and very often talked about his children's book series, the Tuttle Twins series, where he's done books that are beautifully illustrated and that convey to a very young audience a lot of the important ideas of libertarianism. So he did one based on Bastiat's The Law. He did one based on I Pencil by Leonard Reed. He did one on the Federal Reserve of the Tuttle Twins and the Creature from Jekyll Island. Well, now the fourth book is The Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco. So very important and interesting stuff. This is a way for kids to, you know, start to understand what really goes on in the world, frankly, but in a way that's entertaining and not not sledgehammer, not a sledgehammer sort of style, a little bit more subtle than that. Connor is also the president of the Libertas Institute, a Utah-based think tank. Connor, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks, Tom. This is an interesting one. This is not a volume of the series that I would have expected. I can understand. I would have expected the law, maybe the pencil. You know, there's a certain plausibility to this. Creature from Jekyll Island was a smart idea. But this food truck thing I was just telling people about, I think uh, you know, there's, a, there's a certain everyday aspect to it, unlike the Fed. Most people – I mean I suppose you do handle money, but you don't really interact with the Fed all that much. Right. But you, know, you do see food trucks. You do see these little mom-and-pop establishments all over the place, and the idea that they would actually be harassed might actually make a kid think. So how did you come up with this particular idea? Well, as, as your listeners know, we each of our Tuttle Twins books is based on an original text, a book, or essay. And with the other ones, we've been able to incorporate the original title. But this one is based on Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson. And it wasn't really sexy to call it the Tuttle Twins and the One Lesson of Economics or anything like that. So we decided to kind of diverge. It's not readily apparent you know, in the title – what our book is based on, but it does incorporate a lot of these ideas from Hazlitt's book. So we use the concept of food trucks because it's this new emerging industry, but it becomes kind of a foothold through which we introduce young readers and their parents as a secondary audience to this idea that throughout world history, you've had these new innovative enterprises that try and compete against the established players, and they run into all of these arbitrary government regulations that either reduce or outright uh, prohibit their competition. So the food trucks is, is just an example. It's actually a very real uh, example happening around the country where city councils primarily are passing all sorts of arbitrary ordinances in order to shield restaurants from competition. Um, and so it's, it's not a fictional thing necessarily. This is actually happening, but it's only an introductory example because, you know, as your listeners well know, we've got all sorts of other industries and companies like the Ubers and Lyfts and Airbnb that are running into this thing around the country. This is just the vehicle through which we're introducing the principle to young children. We're not teaching them about food trucks. We're teaching them about protectionism. Right, but yet it's done in a way that they don't feel like they're sitting in a classroom and some principle is being taught to them. Instead, they're being exposed to an actual story. And I think, I think as libertarians, we've got all these – we feel like we have so much to teach people and so many things we need them to think differently about that we have to be just painfully didactic and we right. have to <laughs> bash them over the head. Hey, everybody, look at this terrible law and it's – you know, eh, no, 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 no. Get personalize it. Right. In fact, and and by the way, that's advice. By the way, that we could apply to the way we interact with adults, trying to persuade them too. 
I, I totally agree. You know, as as uh, in my full time job uh, leading a think tank here in Utah, it becomes very difficult uh, to do what we do, and that is trying to educate adults, other people on the principles of liberty, free markets, et cetera. And over the past couple of years, I've come to the realization that that your work, Tom, my work, we're, we're not really educating adults. We're trying to first de-educate adults. We're trying to convince them that everything they believe for the past you know, decade or two or three or five is wrong. And that's a hard psychological barrier to overcome to persuade someone that, hey, you know, that high school lesson you got from Miss Susie uh, teaching you that government, you know, saved us from the depression. I mean, you've written books about this, obviously. It's hard to overcome these myths. That requires a lot of investment of time and money and just patience to work with these people and help them see the light. What if we could instead go after the younger generation where those ideas have not yet been planted? And why have we as a liberty movement basically given up on these kids until they come out of high school or college and then we approach them, right? Where they're subjected to literature all growing up that is teaching these awful ideas. We have not been competing for the time and attention and, and loyalty and belief of, of these young children. What if the next Ron Paul is out there and he's eight years old right now and if we don't get him right now, we're not going to get him until he's 43? And what will we miss in those intervening years where if we get him now – and give him a foundation of freedom, teach him these fun, uh, interesting concepts in a way he can understand, we give him that foundation of freedom, what's he going to be like when he's 17 or 23 or 31? Um, you know, we often try and um, talk to a lot of people about the series and they say, well, what are your metrics? What are you hoping to accomplish? And I say, honestly, this isn't something we can calculate other than book sales because we don't know who, you know, that next Ron Paul is out there. We don't know what the impact is going to be this book series. What we do know is we as a you know liberty movement more generally need to be playing in that space. We need to be offering parents materials so they can teach their kids. Otherwise, we're going to have to overcome these hard barriers as adults, and that's just a, a huge hurdle to overcome. It's funny that you at random – chose the age 43. Well, what if we wait till he's 43? Well, I'm 43. So <laughs> you're saying if you wait to this age, forget it, it's hopeless. Well, you can I, teach old dogs new tricks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it takes a lot of uh, investment of time. You know, actually, I over the weekend, I spoke by, via Skype to the uh, convention of a, of a new uh, classical liberal political party in Norway, and I made exactly that point. I said, don't try to, don't try to persuade people like me. I mean, you, sh you know, might as well give it a shot, but don't expect a lot. Whereas the younger people... They haven't formed their ideas fully yet. You might be able to reach them. Even though they don't vote, you're investing in the future, so to speak, because if you get them then, there's a chance that they might – because, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. There's no, there's no way I'm changing my mind on any major thing at this point. It's, it's <laughs> a, a, virtually impossible. I mean I have changed my mind on a few things, but, but it seems pretty unlikely. Uh, let, let, let me tell a little story about my own kids and something they observed that's very much in line with uh, this particular volume in the Tuttle Twin series. Yeah. Back when we were living in Auburn, Alabama, and I was in residence at the Mises Institute, there was a woman on our street who made the most delicious chicken salad you've ever had. Like most chicken salad, it's either too much mayonnaise and you have to you have to, you know, fish around, hire a private detective to find the chicken in it. <laughs> well, this woman had the most and I mean you could put it on sandwiches, you could put it on crackers, you could just eat it with a spoon. It was just so good. And she had all these varieties, and we were all addicted to it. We we just we couldn't we just couldn't live without it. And she just made it out of her own kitchen. Well, you see where that's going? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She didn't well, have a food handler's permit. Or uh, that's exa yeah, exactly. And, and the other people in town who made the most rotten chicken salad in the world, you wouldn't want – I mean if, you, if it was the last thing on earth, you would say, you know what? I don't want my time on earth to have that as my last memory. I'm just going <laughs> to expire. So she got in trouble, and she was told you cannot produce this chicken salad anymore. And so for a while, we were deprived of it, and I, I was going crazy. Like I would go – just, just you know, force a habit. I'd open the fridge for the chicken – there's no chicken salad in there. So she wound up getting the last laugh though, and she opened her own shop, and it's called The Chicken Salad Chick. Nice. And sh she now has a whole bunch of locations all across the South. It was a smash hit. So she got back at whatever rotten competitor ratted her out. She got revenge times 100. And in her main store in Auburn, she's got a big sign that tells the story of Chicken Salad Chick. And it includes mention of the Mises Institute, hmm. which came to her defense on the blog when she was shut down. Nice. Because everybody at the Mises Institute was addicted to her chicken salad. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the reason I tell 
tell the story is that my kids loved her chicken salad. And when they were, when they found out why they couldn't have it anymore, that burned a lesson into their brains they'll never forget. Oh, yeah. Well, these, these children understand that there's a fundamental injustice going on, right? Like, no one's being harmed. I like the chicken salad. Why is the government doing this? I don't understand it. And we see this throughout industries, throughout all levels of government, throughout the country. I mean, one of the biggest fights going on right now is a really silly one that the Institute for Justice has been doing for years on African hair braiding. And in all these different states, oh, yeah. including in Utah, right, these, these cosmetology industries have basically become symbiotic with the state. They've gotten the protectionist regulations they want such that, among many other things, people who want to braid African hair, no chemicals, no nothing dangerous going on, just braiding, have to go and you know spend whatever it is, 2,000 hours in school and pay all these fees and fill out an application. And yet what happens is, unlike the example you share where the, uh, the chicken salad chick actually worked through those hurdles, got all her permission slips in order, and then opened a, a successful business, what you find in a lot of these cases is that it discourages entrepreneurialism. These protectionist barriers sometimes are so hard to overcome or so you know costly or whatever, people just throw in the towel and say, you know what, I'm not going to. So much like where I was mentioning with the Title Twin series, like what if there's that next Ron Paul out there that if we don't get him now, we're not going to get him for half a century. What are all the business opportunities right now that because of protectionist regulations, these would-be entrepreneurs decide to just move on with their lives and not deal with the hassle where we would benefit from just an amazing new product or service that had it been able to kind of, you know, germinate and, and build and grow and thrive would have been this amazing thing. But we'll never know because these protectionist regulations got in the way. You know, I'm thinking back to what you said at the very beginning about the book being based on uh, Henry Hazlitt. And what that reminds me of is you and me talking years ago at some, probably a YAL event maybe, we were talking at some conference, and you were going to do this series, and I was really excited about it. And I said, hey, you know, we should do one, too. And, and my thought, I mean, I, I've come a long way marketing-wise since those days. My thought was, we'll do something on, you know, teaching economics. And with the word economics would be in the title. <laughs> Terrible, right? The, the, the food truck fiasco is, is, a, is so, so much better. So how exactly – just spell out what is the theme of – Henry Hazlitt's classic book that is best illustrated through here. How is it being translated into the story? So, I mean, the, the basic idea of Hazlitt's book, a very famous book written in 1946, it's basically an expansion of a well-known essay by Frederick Bastiat called What is Seen and What is Not Seen. And Bastiat dedicates the brief essay to trying to help us understand that a true economist doesn't just look at the narrow, uh, short-term, uh, easily observable uh, effect of an action, effect of a policy. You have to look at the unintended effects, the long-term effects, the aggregate effects to understand the true impact of any given policy or action. And so he gives a couple examples there. Well, Hazlitt kind of explodes it into an entire book where in the first half he really delves through this concept and trying to understand all of these consequences of an action. And then in the second half of the book, he gives examples to, to walk the reader through uh, how it looks, how you apply that type of economic analysis to all sorts of different policies. Well, you know, it's written in 1946 and Americans used to be able to read a lot more complex material back then. You give, you know, economics in one lesson to a high school and there's all sorts of big words and complex ideas in there that they struggle with. And so we wanted to simplify it, of course, for, for the readers age five to 10. We can't, you know, economics, any of these big words and concepts. No, let's take it down to kind of the core idea of what Hazlitt is talking about. And that is, here's, you know, a, a restaurant owner and he's buddies with the mayor. And they've kind of collaborated and, and conspired to create a policy that protects this guy. And what does that do? How do, how do we evoke um, the same sense of injustice that your children had, Tom, with the chicken salad? How do we get the, the ch children who are reading the book to understand and feel that same sense of injustice? <clears throat> so we have all these fun different food trucks that are trying to you know, open up business and, and uh, they know one of the small business owners who are trying it out. And then, of course, she gets shut down because there's new, this new regulation. The police arrive to shut her down and they, they do the typical shrug the shoulders in the book. We have them say, well, you know, if you don't like the law, you, know, you should go change it. And that gives the twins an idea, well, wait a minute, how would that actually work? How, how would we go about changing the law? So the book 
does also introduce the readers to a little bit of political uh, activism and media campaigns and trying to um, get uh, public awareness and public sympathy on your side to create political pressure to affect some change. One of the things that we've really bent over backwards to do in each of these books is that we have our main concept. And in this book, it's economic protectionism based on the, the writings of Henry Hazlitt. But we try and introduce these corollary um, type of you know, ideas or influences that political activism or you know, media campaigns or, or uh, some of the other concepts that we introduce in the book aren't necessarily so focused or, or they don't pertain necessarily to the, the core idea. But we can use the storytelling format to introduce some of these other ideas so that our young readers aren't just learning about protectionism. There are a lot of lessons, a lot of things that a parent helping them uh, can discuss and can unpack from the book. And so there's a lot more value to be gained than just a story about economic protectionism. There's six or seven or eight things that can be drawn out of there and can have some fun discussions between parent and child. In a, uh, an email you sent me before we started talking, you mentioned a report, which I hadn't seen, by the Institute for Justice on food trucker freedom. Apparently now we have a report even on that. So what <laughs> what does that tell us? What, what can we learn from that? So uh, this was a report done a few years ago uh, by the guys at Institute for Justice. If any of your listeners don't know who they are, a phenomenal group worthy of support or at least just reading their material. It's, it's ij.org. And it's a libertarian law firm. They do some policy analysis as well. But basically these guys are trying to uh, work th <clears throat> excuse me, through litigation to overturn a lot of these uh, croniest – uh, protectionist laws around the country. So we mentioned earlier that they do these African hair braiding cases and occupational licensure. Well, they've also done a lot of work on food trucks specifically. In fact, it was fun when we came up with the concept for the book. I reached out to the authors of the study and they were really thrilled to kind of see that, oh, hey, there's going to be this children's book about this idea, this, this project that we worked on. The report kind of surveys all of these different cities around the country to look at some of the different uh, arbitrary and flat out stupid policies that these city councils pass such as you know oh your food truck has to have this you know high grade kitchen oven that you'd only find in a restaurant or you're not allowed to park in the same place in two consecutive days and all of these just random arbitrary things that become very clear especially when you review them around the country you kind of see them all lumped together in this report there's no empirical evidence that any of this is necessary for food safety right if government legitimately exists to to protect us from the aggressive actions of others protect our our, our person our, our property you know, you can reasonably um, articulate an argument that it's okay to have regulations that are designed to prevent legitimate, you know, outbreaks or food contamination or what have you. But when you review in the Institute for Justice's report on, on food truck freedom, what these cities are doing to these food trucks, a very innovative thing. If, if none of your listeners, have you, have you ever eaten at a food truck, Tom? Has your family ever done it before? Sure, plenty of times. Right. They're insanely popular. I mean, you see them at sporting events, you see them at carnivals and everything else. They're fun. And you can walk in like a, you know, 100, 150 square foot environment and you've got like six options there that you can do. So people love them. Consumers are being serviced. There's uh, high popularity, high uh, satisfaction. Uh, so the government has clearly exceeded its boundaries. Institute for Justice's report does a really thorough job at kind of vetting what's going on. Um, and then, of course, they have recommendations, policy recommendations and, and active lawsuits to try and actually move the needle on this issue and raise awareness because, of course, as is our book, uh, so is their report. It's not really just about food trucks. It's just another example, the latest, hottest trend through which we can introduce readers to this much larger concept that's happened throughout world history, uh, that of economic protectionism. Look at, of course, Bastiat's essay on the Candlemaker's Petition. I mean, this has been going on since time immemorial where people are very jealous about guarding uh, their jobs and they don't want competition to undermine them. Tell me about – I hadn't realized this actually. I've followed Uber – you know, more or less, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in the political opposition that they encounter. But uh, you were telling me again in this email about a strategy that Uber and Lyft have employed in particular jurisdictions where they are, uh, you know, where they'd have to pay a fine for operating. They're not supposed to be operating. Right. And yeah. So, yeah, so how have they dealt with that? It's very interesting. 
It's very interesting and very smart uh, because think of this this new innovative company, right? Taxis are extremely entrenched, extremely uh, interwoven with with the city governments uh, in which they operate. And so if you're a new innovative company, are you going to try and go, you know, hat in hand, say, mother may I to these uh, city councils all around the country or world rather and basically beg for permission to compete against uh, this established in, uh, environment and network that's been set up for decades. Well, no, you're not going to be successful. And so Uber and Lyft had this great strategy. In fact, I think it's Uber has a, a specific handbook outlining this, this strategy. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give an example here in uh, Salt Lake City uh, where uh, I work as an example of what they've been doing elsewhere as well. So uh, they decided to basically circumvent policy and just begin to operate. And what they told the drivers who began to uh, drive for them in Salt Lake City is, well, hey, look, if you run into any legal trouble, we'll just pay your legal fees. And so what that did is that allowed a market to begin to build here in Salt Lake City as it has elsewhere. Uh, people began to uh, drive. People, uh, you know, Passengers began popping up. An entire network constituency began to develop. People loved the service as they love it everywhere else. And then Salt Lake City uh, Airport Authority found out about it and started doing the, um, what do they call it, the secret shopper kind of approach where they'd have government agents pretend to be writers and then they'd cite the individual and send them a ticket in the mail to the tune of $6,500 per citation. Whoa. Uh, we, we interviewed a, a single mom here at Libertas Institute when we blew the lid open on, on this happening here in Utah. We found a single mom who, um, of course, had, had she done this on her own, had she done this without uh, the assurance that Uber and Lyft would, would pay for the, the ticket that she incurred, she wouldn't have been able to do that. She can't afford $650, let alone $6,500. And yet with that financial backing, she began to go out and, and uh, offer rides to all sorts of passengers, meet all sorts of people, and provide a, a legitimate service. So the company stepped in and were paying everything. But what happened is when they then went to the city, City Council to try and change the law, they had much more leverage. They had stronger a stronger negotiating position because now they had hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, who supported what they were doing, showing up to meetings in their t-shirts. It created enough political pressure where they were able to get the law changed that allowed them to legitimately compete uh, and operate here in Utah. So it's a very strategic way that they've tried to overcome these protectionist hurdles. Too often we see um, around the country people going to the legislature and saying, mother may I? Well, no, that's why I think you need approaches like Uber and Lyft that's kind of this guerrilla warfare style or Institute for Justice where you can do it through litigation rather than legislation uh, because the problem is that the political bodies are compromised where the legislators or the mayors or, or what have you are buddies with the people who benefit from this or they've been receiving campaign uh, donations from the different industries and trade associations that benefit from this. And so saying mother may I isn't really effective in overcoming these barriers. That's why I really like the approach that Uber and Lyft have taken. Uh, they haven't replicated this everywhere, but but that's been one of their key strategies to open up these new markets to just develop a renegade constituency that won't take no for an answer, then go into negotiate rather than saying mother may I at the outset. Very smart. Very smart indeed. Now, you told me that you haven't yet announced what the subject of the fifth book, this being the fourth, that we're talking about, the fifth book in the Tuttle Twin series. You haven't announced this to anybody, and yet you didn't even tell me so that I could be surprised as well that you were going to share this for the first time with the listeners of the show. So you ready to tell us what it's about? I'm ready. You know, we've been debating how and when we want to release it, but I'll, I'll preface the story here. Um, I was at a homeschool conference a few weeks ago. I've been uh, exhibiting uh, for the Tuttle Twins at all sorts of different homeschool conferences across the country. And I'll take a quick tangent uh, only to tell you, Tom, that it's been a fun experience because as I'm sitting there at these booths in Texas and Ohio and, uh, and elsewhere, people will come up and they'll be like, oh, I heard about this. Where did I hear about this? And they'll say, oh, yeah, it was on the Tom Woods show. <laughs> nice. And so we've had all sorts of your listeners coming up to these, these booths all around the country. It's been pretty fun. That's great. Um, and so I've, I've, uh, I was at an Ohio conference, and it was April Fool's, so this was about a month or so ago. And Elijah, the illustrator, and I started chatting, and we're like, hey, we should do something for Tuttle Twins for April Fool's. And so he created, just in 15 minutes, a really quick and dirty cover um, uh, cover design of a you know fictional book, uh, pretend book that we might create, and it was called uh, The Tuttle Twins Built the Roads. 
And so it was all <laughs> an answering this, this core libertarian question of who will build the roads. And they have like their construction hard hats on and there's a road sign behind them. And, and people just gobbled it up when we posted on Facebook. And they were so de – like we deceived a lot of people. And this was actually late in the day. You think that like by 3 p.m. most people like are on guard and recognize that it's April Fool's and they're just not going to believe anything the rest of the day. We duped a ton of people. And when they found out that, that, we, that we weren't doing it, they were sorely disappointed. And, you know, I mean, the, the books that we've done have all been great. They've been based on popular texts. Not as many people, interestingly, uh, dealing with the book for this episode, are familiar with economics in one lesson. We found that a lot of people haven't read the original. Um, and so that's been fun to kind of re-popularize uh, or, or spread the word about Hazlitt's book. But like every libertarian knows the whole, you know, who will build the roads argument. And so we had all sorts of people saying, oh, I would buy that book. You know, I wish you would. And we weren't planning on it at all. But Elijah and I in the days since were thinking, well, you know, what if? What, what if we actually did a book? So that's what book five is going to be. We're actually going to name it The Tuttle Twins and The Road to Serfdom. And so we're going to uh, base it on, on The Road to Serfdom by Hayek, where he talks about central planning and, and the idea that the voluntary organizations are superior to the, the downsides of all the central planning that can't foresee the future and, and uh, retool and everything. And so what we're going to do is serfdom, it's going to be spelled S-U-R-F-D-O-M, and it's going to be the name of a beach. And so the Tuttle family is going to live near this beach called Serfdom, and the government wants to build a road, a literal road to serfdom to um, satisfy some of the congestion that's happening. But they want to do it through eminent domain. So again, we're going to introduce some of these kind of corollary ideas to the young reader apart from just central planning. And so the Tuttle twins are going to kind of get together and figure out how they can get a road to serfdom or a road to the beach without going through eminent domain. And so we'll see kind of these free market voluntary organizations of the Tuttle uh, family and their friends literally building a road uh, to compete against the government and central planning and eminent domain. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Elijah and I have been brainstorming the concepts, but the whole who will build the road idea is one that just entices a ton of people. We can base it on the road to serfdom, do a little twist in the title. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and we're hoping to have it out probably November so that in time for Christmas people uh, can get it. But that's going to be book five. Well, that is a really, really good idea. Of course, I'm <laughs> the thing that comes to my mind is you could co-author it with Walter Block. And yeah. <laughs> the, the, the joke there is not just that he wrote a book on roads, but that almost or the huge, huge number of his of his scholarly articles are co-authored, and he, we, that's he's known for this. He'll he, I've been asked by Walter to co-author probably five <laughs> articles, and I only did one of them. But that's what he always does. He always brings on co-authors. So <laughs> this would be this would be fun. I mean, it's hilarious, right? Because we're all asked this question. It's the fundamental baseline. Oh, yeah, of course. All asked. And, and the funny thing is the reaction, especially as we've been doing these booths around the country, is people will see it. And, and if they don't buy it, they'll at least kind of chuckle and they'll be like, I, I can't tell you how many times someone will say something to the effect of, oh, it's in a reading format that someone in Congress can understand. You know, yeah, like right, you, right. You, you've dumbed it down. And so now we as libertarians have finally, we're going to be able to dumb down the answer to the question of who will build the roads. You can now give it to them in a very disarming format that's not a thick Walter Block book or, you know, a big scholarly white paper necessarily. We're going to answer it on a very simpleton level so that people can understand so we don't have to talk about it anymore. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's sometimes I write my book so I never have to discuss the subject again. Look, I've already <laughs> written a book. Forget about it. I, I almost think the Tuttle Twins Built the Roads is a better title, but that's a debatable thing. Maybe we could have a poll on the show notes page if I were technically savvy enough to do that. Oh, yeah. We're open to feedback, yeah. I Because I, I think that the, the elegant simplicity of that and the in-your-face and the fact that you got basically proof of concept right there at that event from that. Yeah. Because maybe you're trying to be too clever by half a, a little bit with it, but but maybe. but look, there's nothing. Look, I also like, but you know, look, that's one of the most well-known classical liberal books of all time, The Road to Serfdom. So I mean, that right. that could also be a good idea. But anyway, I don't think you can go wrong either way. I think I think that that one's a definite winner. Uh, just take uh, thirty seconds to tell people about the the workbooks that accompany the the books. Yeah, so uh, if your listeners haven't yet got the books, we, we offer a, a huge freebie. So if you go to tuttletwins.com, 
you get the books, but then we throw in all the workbooks for free. We throw in a couple other things for free as well. Tom gives a discount to Liberty Classroom to the people who buy the, uh, the, the combo pack there. What we do, the whole idea behind the workbooks is every, um, every Tuttle Twins book, physical paperback book, has an accompanying workbook. And the idea there is that once the children have read the material, so if they've read you know, the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil and they've learned about the free market and spontaneous order and these new concepts – in the workbook, they have age-appropriate material, right? So for the younger kids, it's a coloring page or it's a, a crossword puzzle or whatever. And then we've got activities as they get older uh, that are more appropriate. Those activities reinforce uh, the, the very words and concepts that they learned in the book. And so if they're doing a word search, they're going to search for order or search for market. And we kind of just reinforce the concepts. It gives a good opportunity for parents and children together to kind of uh, reanalyze and continue to talk about what was learned in the book. It's been so phenomenal for me. I mean, I've shared on one of your past uh, interview episodes we did, Tom, that when Elijah and I started the first book, it was more just um, throwing it out there to see if anyone liked it. We we wanted the book to exist for us selfishly for our kids because we love Bastiat's The Law so much, but we had no idea what the response would be. And it has been overwhelming. It is so fun to see parents discussing these concepts with a six-year-old that they never would have talked about maybe for another decade with their kids. And then by then, who knows what ideas they've been introduced to and what they have to kind of combat to get the child to understand. We get so many positive emails. It is so gratifying for us uh, filling that void where nothing exists right now for children literature to teach the ideas of liberty. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. We're just going to keep going with the books about every seven or eight months. We do a new one. Uh, we hope to end up with at least like eight to 10 in the series. I mean, as you well know, there are so many books, uh, liberty texts out there that we can kind of base these uh, books on. I, I always joke that if I ever figure out how to get a total twins version of human action, then I know yeah. I've done my job. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll call it a day. But until then, we're going to keep going. Well, that really is great. And I, I want to anticipate some of the emails that I will get saying, well, what about Richard Mayberry's Uncle Eric series? And there's nothing wrong with that series, but it's more of a preteen to teenage uh, age range. And these books right. can be read profitably by children who are younger than that. And that's what we mean when we say that it's filling a void. I don't know of any series or any books that are really all that great for, for kids that age. Mm -hmm. So anyway, TuttleTwins.com is the website. Grab all the books, get all the freebies, uh, and have those conversations with your kids. And there's no way that's going to turn out to be a bad decision. Uh, congratulations on another entry in the series, and thanks a lot, Connor. Thank you as always, Tom. All right, on the show notes page today, tomwoods.com slash 654, I will, of course, link to the Tuttle Twins series of books. But you know what? I'm also going to link to the chicken salad chick, doggone it, because if you live in the southeastern U.S., chances are, well, there's at least a possibility that you may live near one. And if you do, go check it out, because it's, it's really delicious. And in fact... Some years ago in my family, we seriously talked about the possibility of joining and, and basically creating a franchise uh, a restaurant, uh, franchising with them because they do have franchise opportunities. Because I thought this is the kind of restaurant that when people go in there, they are immediately hooked on the food and it spreads like wildfire in terms of word of mouth. People just fall in love with it every single place the thing opens. And, you know, obviously there are no sure things in the world, but to me this looked like a sure thing. Like th I know this restaurant will do well. Everybody loves this food, and most people have never tasted it before. But then I basically just decided, well, obviously we live in Kansas, and that's actually not one of the states that's available. But if we ever did move to the southeastern U.S., which actually looks possible – we had considered it, and then I just basically thought, eh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want the hassle of having a restaurant. But if I did, I would actually have a franchise of the uh, Chicken Salad Chick. So I'm going to put that up there. And if you go to the About Us section of chickensaladchick.com, you will see the Mises Institute mentioned. How about <laughs> How about that? It's actually right there on the website. I just checked. All right, that's it for today. Tomorrow we've got... A serious, serious, serious misunderstanding on the part of a, an Austrian economist, and we are going to correct it. It is very important that this error be corrected, and we are going to correct it in epic fashion on tomorrow's episode. That's all I'll say. I'll say no more. 
You'll just have to tune in and listen for yourself. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.